If you're old like me, you'll most likely remember the Pepsi Challenge, where Pepsi would set up these trucks all over the United States at supermarkets and malls. They had these little booths for a taste test, Pepsi versus Coke. The tests were administered by Pepsi employees, and they knew which cup had Pepsi and which cup had Coke. And obviously this is a problem if the employees were incentivized to make Pepsi the winner, which they probably would be, then you would end up with Pepsi winning the competition, which, surprise, surprise, it did. This is what's called a single blind test. It's an early form of scientific falsification, a means for a scientist to evaluate the results without bias from test subjects. Now the first time this test was done was in 1784 during the French Royal Commission on Animal Magnetism. Mesmerism basically because the ideas they were testing here were directly influenced by Mesmer himself. The test was devised by Anton Lavoisier to determine whether or not magnetism worked. Participants were tricked into believing they had been magnetized when they hadn't been. Others were magnetized without their knowledge. This allowed the influence of the magnetism on the individuals to be determined without them knowing whether or not they had truly been magnetized, thereby avoiding placebos and other type of effects, right? And as you are no doubt aware, mesmerism is a form of pseudoscience. Yet it was the inspiration, the muse, the catalyst for the creation of the single blind test. You've read the title, you know where this is going. Hi, I'm Dan and welcome to Dunking. Competition has always made living organisms more advanced, more efficient, more complex, just plain better overall. To the earliest single-celled organisms, to the fighting techniques in the MMA, to the graphics card at your local Best Buy, competition was a big, huge driving factor in how good that thing is. For example, at World War II, at the beginning of it, most air forces still used biplanes, and by the end, just six years later, rockets and jets were being used on the battlefield. The competition made people willing to put in more effort, think more, be willing to take risks that would be otherwise considered unacceptable. If you've ever competed in anything, from sports to hearthstone, you'll know that the only way to really get better is to compete with those at or above your skill level. And while this competition may be less than enjoyable at times, it is absolutely crucial for us to get better at anything. My son loves wrestling and he hates wrestling practice because it wears his butt out. But he knows if he wants to get good, he's going to have to go to those practices all the time. Pseudoscience tends to rub mainstream scientists the wrong way. For obvious reasons. I mean, imagine somebody coming to your job, doesn't really know what they're talking about. They just start saying all sorts of silly shit. And you're just like, what the hell are you even talking about? You can understand why pseudoscience can kind of irritate people in those fields. So when the French Royal Commission on Animal Magnetism was set out to debunk all this nonsense, it attracted many early scientists, people like Anton Lavoisier. He was one of the good chemists back in those days. In order to debunk this, the single blind experiment was devised. Lavoisier was a chemist. Chemistry is really a field that doesn't operate under the same empirical falsification that many other sciences do. Yet Lavoisier came up with a robust method of testing something in another field in order to debunk pseudoscience. You could say that mesmerism was his muse. Or you could say that he hated it so much that he created a very powerful tool to debunk it, and we still use that tool today. It doesn't really matter. Maybe right now you're thinking, oh, but we would have came up with that on its own. We would have figured that one out eventually. Sure, okay, maybe, but we didn't. Lavoisier had that rattling around in his brain for however long, and uh, mesmerism was what got him to pick, pick, reach in there and pluck that thing out and put it on the table. And <laughs> thanks to him, we know that Pepsi tastes better than Coke. Now, the double bind experiment is what the Pepsi challenge should have been if it was really honest, where you, both the person administering the test and the person taking the test don't know if they're drinking Pepsi or Coke until you actually compile the results. There's no way that that could have possibly been invented because of pseudoscience, so that'd be ridiculous, right? Well, actually, it was the inspiration behind the methods used in 1835 in Nuremberg, Germany. Homeopathy had become popular, and its validity was heavily questioned by many. A skeptical newspaper article had caused a homeopathic doctor, Johann Jacob Ruder, to issue a formal challenge. He challenged the author of the article, Frederick Wilhelm von Hoven, to test his specially diluted salt mixture on himself. He claimed the odds were 10 to 1 van Hoven would feel the effects himself, and the public reaction was not exactly what he wanted, though. As many of the skeptics started trying this for themselves, it became a real popular thing, kind of a meme back in the 1835s. And this culminated in a large public trial financed by that newspaper, with 120 people showing up to a bar where it was initiated. They did science in better environments back in those days, I just have to say, by the way, scientists, if you're paying attention, uh, take a page from the old days. And 47 of these people were given a vial of water. Seven more were handed out afterwards, making for a total of 54 participants. There were originally 100 vials, and they were numbered, split up randomly, and one group was filled with the homeopathic salt water while the other was filled with regular water. 
The vials were then cataloged and the list was sealed. Then the bottles were distributed and anyone who received one had their name and number of the vial recorded. After three weeks, they returned and were asked what effects the vial had on them. Only 50 of the 54 were asked. Four people went missing from the test, it seems. Eight people claimed that they experienced the effects of the homeopathic water, while the other 42 experienced nothing unusual. Now, out of the eight people that experienced something, five of them had received the homeopathic solution, but there were so many more that had received it that had experienced nothing that the test was determined to have proven the salt water solution ineffective. Only one in 10 had experienced anything, and almost that many had claimed to have experienced it with no magic water at all. Not only was this the first recorded double-blind experiment, but it was painstakingly methodical for such a public trial, put on by a journalistic body, no less. They documented how many people participated in the first half but didn't return for the last half. A placebo was employed to test for mental influence rather than chemical. Randomization was used. and Basically, this experiment was groundbreaking in numerous ways, and it was all put together by the owner and editor of a newspaper, one George Lohner. He wasn't a scientist, but he was into that sort of thing. He played one in the newspaper, and he put this whole shebang together. And his team created one of the most influential studies of its time. We still use a double-blind study every day in labs across the world today. Now again, we had a lot of great minds here that had these ideas in them, but to pull that idea out, it took the fire lit under their belly of pseudoscience. It, it took that competition. It took that warring. And that fire was lit by some quack who believed that salt water was magic. Take him out of the equation, and what does science lose? How far back do we go? That's 1835, so maybe just 50 years? So think about this. This is, this, is a, this is a huge part of the whole dance here. Again, think World War II and how much stuff advanced in a very short period of time because of competition. You can find this dynamic at play all over different manners in the scientific world. In the early days of the radio, claims of telepathy were met with skeptical radio hosts who made tests, asking their audiences to pick a number and then mail in the answer, or having some people look at objects and then people write in what they would telepathically saw those people looking at. I'm sure you'll be shocked to know that none of these tests really were proven to do anything good at all, but they were devised, they were early forms of public tests to kind of debunk things, and there was some methodology being brought to bear by people outside the field. But if you really want to see the inspiration, the way that this can elicit brilliance from people, watch James Randi debunk people. He, when he would debunk people that would come up with like some magical BS kind of stuff, his debunkings are all over YouTube. They were about the time I was like five years old was when he got popular doing that, that I remember probably before then. But uh, there's a lot of those videos of him just blasting people that they had this great trick and then not so much. And you can watch the gears turn, man. This guy, he, he hadn't devised this test ahead of time necessarily. Sometimes he did, but a lot of times you could see him just like on the cuff. Bam, gotcha. And that, that pseudoscience is his effing muse, man. Was his muse, Mr. Randy, R.I.P. <laughs> I'm going to ask the challengers to um, put the powder on their hands and on their chests and then make the object stay there. Uh, <laughs> 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 And of course, there's times when claims that are labeled pseudoscience become real science. The meteor impact killing off the dinosaurs was considered pseudoscience when I was a little guy. Peptic ulcers are caused by bacteria. At least part of the reason they're caused is by bacteria, but that was considered pseudoscience back in the 80s. The bacteria was discovered, and the hypothesis and the bacteria was related to the ulcers was made, but it took over a decade for it to be accepted. A continental drift, a now firmly accepted part of geology, was considered pseudoscience for over 50 years. Alfred Wegener, a German meteorologist, first posited the idea in 1912, calling it continental displacement. No, not earth crust displacement, this one was not, this continental displacement. It wasn't accepted until the mid-1960s, though. And Wegener had passed by then, but the accusation of him being a pseudoscientist had not stopped him from doing more research. He was quite certain his theory was correct, and history has shown this to be true. But for half a century, he was a quack, a nutter with a degree. And this nutter's ideas are taught to unenthusiastic middle schoolers all across the world nowadays. 
Now, I've mentioned before how much Ben from Uncharted X pushing those vases has been good for the community as a whole, so I won't go into a lot of detail here. But suffice it to say that Ben has forced the scientific and debunker community to figure out how to make those vases using only the available tools from those times. And if the vases he's scanning are legit, if those kinds of measurements show up in vases and museums with confirmed provenance, this would push the dating to the lathe back a couple thousand years in ancient Egypt. That's no mean feat. I mean, it's not going to be rewriting the, every papyrus that we've got on the shelves, but it changes the history of technology in ancient Egypt, which, it, again, not exactly the way Ben wanted it to, but it's exactly what he set out to do in one way. So in some ways, I think that this is baby with the bathwater quite frequently, and it's sad. I mean, channels like Scientists Against Myth and Sacred Geometry Decoded exist because of Ben and the ideas like him. Now, the men there are brilliant on their own, but they put these ideas out into the world to battle Ben. It, they're sharpening their swords against each other. Another point that should be addressed, and I've mentioned it before, but we'll talk about it again here really quickly, is the carbon dating of the Egyptian pyramids and temples. The first solid work was financed by the Edgar Cayce Foundation. They didn't expect to find dates to come up so close to the official timeline. They were looking for that 10,000 BC date that all the cool kids like, right? But they put out the coin where no one else would. And then a decade later, David Koch spent even more coin on even more buildings. And again, the Fourth Dynasty dates were about 150 to 300 years off. And by most accounts, Mr. Koch was expecting something far older, somewhere again back in like the 10,000-ish. But despite the shattered dreams of those who pushed this forward, the data that they brought out has helped us advance our knowledge in ancient Egypt. Period. End of story. No matter what they wanted to find, what they did find is publicly available and quite helpful in determining the timeline of ancient Egypt. Now, the Egyptian authorities have financed several studies, but this is something that isn't flashy, it doesn't help tourism, and as such, it fell on private individuals to finance or not. And both times that we've had this person or organization with the inspiration and the money to do this, they've been interested in pseudoscience. Another major contribution that pseudoscience makes, particularly in pseudo-archaeology, is a diminishment of research bias, specifically as it pertains to sites. Now, to put that word salad into layman's terms, guys like Graham Hancock frequently promote sites that you wouldn't know about otherwise. Research bias is a huge issue in archaeology. Now, when it comes to major undertakings, funding comes from private individuals or corporations quite frequently. This means a place like Giza gets 100 times the attention Gigantia does. Neither the Edgar Cayce Foundation nor David Koch were interested in financing the dating of the Cahokia Mound, for example. It's just not as popular, so there's far less people just sitting around daydreaming about it. And out of those, far fewer have the money to do anything. But thanks to guys like Graham Hancock, though, tens of thousands of people are aware of these temples on Malta that wouldn't have been aware of them. And this goes for Gadong Padang and Nan Madal, Bright Insights, Right Sack Structure, a bunch of places like this. All of these places would be unheard of to most if they hadn't been popularized by guys like Graham Hancock and Jimmy Corsetti and others. But to archaeologists, these guys are hated. I, I mean hated. To guys like John Hoops, these are public enemy number one. And this vitriol has traditionally led to some very good things, as I've laid out for you here. New discoveries in both methodology and scientific knowledge proper. But in more recent times, rather than focusing on that data, the people concerned with debunking these types of claims have turned that hatred into this political angle, making accusations of unsavory thoughts and using guilt by association to demonize their opposition, rather than doing better science and promoting it better. This is not only intellectually bankrupt, as it gives us a bunch of people asserting their political inclinations or scientific fact, or at least gets to stick them in their own little lab coat, but it also does a disservice to science at large. When a pseudoscientist makes a claim, the scientist opposed to that claim should be focused on disproving that claim with science and making that data palatable to the public. Instead, they attempt to bypass this issue by claiming the pseudoscientist involved is rooted in something grotesque or this guy, he said something and, and whatever. So we may see a few years here where society doesn't gain the benefits we traditionally have from that conflict between science and pseudoscience. And sadly, that's because the scientists aren't doing their job right anymore. And when they stop, the natural benefits of this interaction, they just dry up and wither on the vine and fall to the ground. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to watch. I've been sick and I still feel like shit, so I apologize for my appearance, voice, demeanor, whatever. Um, thank you so much, especially to my patrons. Um, click the buttons down below. Um, thank your local pseudoscientist for the Pepsi Coke challenge, and we will see you next time.